I want to tell you a story about a, a man who was a fugitive and a criminal. And his crime was so severe that if he were caught, there was the possibility he would face the death sentence. This wanted man was very literally running for his life. But he had decided to run to the most unusual of places. You'd think that if you're a wanted man, you'd run to the countryside or perhaps a remote area somewhere where no one's going to take notice of you. But instead, this man runs to another prisoner. What, mo- what would possibly motivate a criminal to run to visit a prisoner? Well, this young man, he'd heard of another criminal who had recently been placed under house arrest. And he had every reason to believe that this criminal would be able to help him in his dire situation. Now, when he arrived at the house, the guards were very strict and very thorough, and they had good reason to. This criminal in this house was one of the most influential men in the world. Some had even said he turned the world upside down with his radical ideas. Now, so much had been said about this man, and yet when this young fugitive walked into the home and came face to face with this criminal, he was unimpressed. He'd heard so much about this man, and yet here was an elderly man curled over, sitting at a desk, writing. He had a very small frame, a quite unmemorable face. The way he carried himself did not necessarily exert authority and power. And yet this young fugitive still felt small in comparison to this elderly man. The young fugitive began to wonder to himself, is this really the man that has changed the world so much? The elderly man gestured towards the fugitive. Please take a seat, he said. What brings you here, young man? The fugitive waited a few moments, trying to find the words and muster the courage to put his petition before this great man. He began to say, I've heard that you and my superior are good friends. And he's told me that you are a good man. He speaks very highly of you. The elderly man began to say, well, I have many close friends. Who exactly is your master? The young fugitive paused for a few more seconds as beads of sweat came down his face. And he replied to the elderly man, The name of my master is Philemon, and I am his slave, Onesimus. The old man gave a small smile. He replied, Philemon is indeed a close friend of mine. And even though you've illegally run away from him, you thought your best idea was to find refuge with one of his closest friends? Onesimus was silent as he recognized the absurdity of his plan. But again, he had heard that the Apostle Paul was a kind and merciful man and could not think of anyone better to turn to. Your plan is certainly unusual, Anisimus, Paul replied, but I do believe that you've come to the right place. This is one of the most beautiful stories that we find in the Bible of three men, Paul, Philemon and Anisimus. It's a story of the slave Onesimus who runs away from his master Philemon And he decides to find fugitive with one of his master's best friends, the Apostle Paul. And the story of these three men, it's recorded in just one book of the Bible, one book with only 25 verses. And yet in this very small book, there's an incredibly intimate and personal letter that is written by Paul. And ultimately, I think the the question that this letter seeks to answer is this. How powerful is love? Now, on the surface, that can sound a little bit wishy-washy or even a bit cliche or trite, largely because we throw around the word love very willy-nilly in our culture. It seemed to lost a lot of the, the impact that it's once had. We, you, we hear people talk very abstractly, well, the world would be a better place if everyone just loved each other, or... If we all just got along, everything would look better. But what does that really look like? We often throw around phrases like that, but we don't actually unpack what that means. What would the world look like if everyone did love each other? 
Well, the letter that Paul writes to Philemon gives us a very real, a very practical and very applicable answer to this question of how powerful is love. So let's turn to the book of Philemon together. We're going to go through the whole book. As I said, it's only a very brief book, 25 verses, right before the book of Hebrews and right after the epistle to Titus. The book of Philemon. And we're going to, as I said, answer this question, how powerful is love? Philemon, uh, Paul begins his letter to Philemon with the following. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. To the beloved Epiphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier. And to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very standard opening to an epistle of Paul's, uh, describing himself, those who he's writing to and from, and his very typical ending, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And here Paul describes himself as a prisoner and This is both uh, very literal and very metaphoric. Literally at this point, he is under house arrest as a prisoner. He's not free to leave from his home. He's allowed to receive visitors, but he can't go out. He is very literally a prisoner. And more, uh, we might say on a metaphorical spiritual level, he's a prisoner to Christ in that he owes everything to him. And the reason he is under arrest is because of his preaching of Christ. This is the great crime for which Paul has been imprisoned for, the fact that he preaches Christ and him crucified. And you'll notice in these first three verses, Paul twice uses the word beloved. He uses it to describe Philemon, and then he uses it to describe Apiphia. And you're going to notice love or beloved is a word that Paul uses very frequently in this book here. In fact, Paul is actually doing a little bit of play on words in these opening sentences. Uh, As you probably know, there were several different words in Greek for love. The one we're perhaps most familiar with is agape love, which is a selfless love. But another word for love used by the Greeks was phileo, which was a brotherly love, uh, a love between siblings. And this is where Philemon gets his name from. Phileo, brotherly love, Philemon. Philemon's name literally means loving or brotherly love. So when you read that, it would be to Philemon, to loving our beloved friend. Paul is appealing to Philemon's character. He's a man known for his love. Even his very name means brotherly love. We continue reading on in verse 4. Paul says, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Isn't it interesting? Paul says that he thanks God in prayer for the successful ministry of Onesimus, uh, of Philemon. That's not usually something we include in our prayer life, is it? We often ask God for help with our personal evangelism, uh, with the evangelism of our local church. But we don't usually include in our prayer thanking God for the success of of others, the success of other Christians or other churches where we can see God moving. And Paul, again, you'll notice he mentions that Philemon is a man of great love. For we have great joy in consolation in your love. Paul is praising, he's uh, encouraging Philemon. He's uh, giving encouragement for this good attribute that he has. And he's doing this specifically because he's about to ask Philemon something which will demand great love. 
verse 8, Paul is going to make his uh, appeal to Philemon, this request that will require great love for him, from him. He says, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. Being such a one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who was once unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. Verse 9 begins with perhaps some of my most favorite words in the Bible, yet for love's sake. What would you be willing to do for the sake of love, for the sake of a brotherly or sisterly love between a fellow Christian? Paul, he is asking something big from Philemon. He's making a large request. And he says, the reason I want you to do this is for the sake of brotherly love that exists between fellow Christians. Now, it's actually unclear why Onesimus ran away from his master Philemon. We assume it wasn't because Philemon was treating him poorly. Philemon uh, is given a very good character reference here in this epistle. Paul commends him, says he's a loving, merciful, kind person. So we're not sure why Onesimus ran away. But for whatever reason it was, under Roman law at the time... A slave running away from their master was illegal. If that slave was caught, the master could very well do whatever they wanted with them. They could punish them physically, and it was even acceptable for the master to demand death, should they see it fit. Now again, Philemon is described as a a loving man, so it's unlikely that he would have required uh, or would have had the expectation of wanting Onesimus' head. But you can understand why Onesimus would still be afraid because his master Philemon at the time in the Roman context had the legal right to take his life. And there would be no repercussions for Philemon. But Paul wants to send Onesimus back and he's asking Philemon, don't punish Onesimus. When I send him back to you, don't punish Onesimus for his crime of running away. Even though it's well within your legal right to do so, forgo this right or this freedom. Give it up for the sake of your fellow Christian, for your fellow brother in the faith. In verse 11, uh, Paul once again does a bit of interesting wordplay. The word Onesimus or the name Onesimus means useful. And you'll notice in verse 11... Paul says that Onesimus was once unprofitable, or other English translations say unuseful. But now he is useful. So Onesimus, whose name is, means useful, Paul says, once ago he was unuseful, but now he is useful. What changed? Why is Onesimus, the once unuseful, now useful? It's the fact that he has converted. He's come to Christ. During his stay with Paul, He's become a Christian. Prior to this, he was unuseful. But now that he has come into the Christian faith, Paul says that he is both useful to you and to me. And this is why Paul says, I I desire for him to minister on your behalf here with me. But I know I have to send him back. So now Paul is appealing to Philemon. Onesimus is not just a slave anymore. When he left you, he was just your slave. But now I'm sending you back and he's a fellow Christian. He's come to Jesus in a time where you two were apart. He continues in verse 14. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing. That your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps Onesimus departed for a little while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved 
brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So Paul says, I'm sending you, I'm sending Onesimus back. I want you to not only not punish him, which is well within your right, but I don't want you to accept him back as a slave, but as a fellow believer. And you'll notice Paul wants Philemon to do this voluntarily, out of pure love. He doesn't want to force Philemon to do this. Why, why is this? Why does Paul want him to do it voluntarily? Well, sometimes you can be compelled to do the right thing, and perhaps it's a necessity at some times. For example, each of us probably aren't very joyful givers when we pay taxes to the government. We don't particularly like giving that money. And sometimes that money goes to good things. It builds roads. It'll give a pension to people who are in, uh, in need of that. So some good comes out of the fact that we didn't have a choice paying our taxes. But did we benefit at all? We don't benefit because we're not cheerful givers. We didn't volunteer to do it. So no real good is done on the behalf of the giver. Perhaps the receiver gets some good, but nothing good is done for the giver. Paul recognizes that in order for both parties to benefit, the choice must be voluntary. Now, Paul could have easily pulled rank here. He could have said, I'm an apostle and I'm going to tell you what to do here and I need you to do it. And in fact, we see in other epistles, he's not afraid to do that. He will say, I'm an apostle of Christ and here's where you're doing the wrong thing in your theology and practice. You need to fix it. But here, Paul, he doesn't pull rank because if he did, he could get a good outcome. If he forced Philemon to accept Onesimus, Onesimus would have been back. He would have been safe, not punished. A good outcome could have come from Paul using force. But Paul recognizes that a better outcome comes from Philemon willingly, voluntarily choosing to accept him. Because now Philemon is uh, a cheerful giver, so to speak. Now he is reconciling his relationship with Onesimus. And that's a far better outcome than Onesimus going back and the relationship not being restored. In order for the relationship between these two men to be restored, Philemon had to accept Onesimus willingly. He couldn't have done it because Paul pulled rank on him or made him to. And this is why Paul appeals constantly to Philemon in this text saying, yet for love's sake, for the sake of love between two Christians, will you do this? Don't ask me to force you to. I want you to do it because you love your fellow brother in the faith. You love your fellow sister in the faith. So how does this resolve? Verse 17, Paul says, If you then count me as a partner, receive Onesimus as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention that you owe me, even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers, I shall be granted to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So how does Paul conclude this letter? He asks Paul, uh, he asks Philemon, don't just receive him in a kind of half-hearted way. Receive him the same way that you would receive me. And it's interesting, in verse 22, Paul describes how he expects he's going to be received. He says, meanwhile, prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that I will be granted to you through prayer. So, Paul, he describes, hey, when I arrive, please prepare a guest room for me. And then earlier he says, I want you to receive Onesimus the same way you would me. 
In other words, prepare a guest room. But more than that, do so in a loving, heartfelt manner. Verse 18 and 19 is actually a beautiful picture or metaphor of what Jesus does for us. Here is Onesimus, a man who is uh, under the death penalty. He has a great debt that he cannot pay. And yet Paul intercedes on Onesimus' behalf and he says, if there is a debt to be paid, I will do it on behalf of Onesimus. Paul here is a beautiful illustration of what Jesus does for each of us. He steps in, he intercedes, and he offers to pay the debt that we owe and that we cannot pay. Verse 21 is one of the most convicting verses for me, and it really shook uh, the way that I viewed things. I used to think that I was a pretty decent person because I didn't do anything mean to people, wasn't rude, didn't insult people, I didn't gossip, uh, I was respectful and polite. So I thought that I was a pretty decent person. And then I read this, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Paul here, his definition of love is not doing the bare minimum. It's going above and beyond what is required. And when I realized that, it really turned my world around because I realized my standard of being a good person was doing the bare minimum. Not insulting someone is not something to really be proud of. That's the bare minimum that you can do. Uh, not gossiping or not being rude that's not a big, uh, a cl big claim, something to be proud of. That's the bare minimum. And I noticed all the things that I thought were me being good were all the things I didn't do. I don't do this bad thing, I don't do this bad thing, I don't do this bad thing. But is that being loving? I'm not doing anything bad, but I'm also not doing anything good. What am I actually doing for other people? Love is not just the absence of doing the wrong thing, it's actively doing the right thing for other people and going above and beyond what is required. So Paul here, he, he raises the bar for what love is. It's not the absence of doing wrong. It is doing the right thing for other people, being loving, being merciful, being graceful, doing things for others. So whatever happened to Onesimus? We don't really get a, a conclusion to the story here. He just writes and he says he's going to send him away. Well, in Colossians chapter 4, we get maybe a little bit of a hint as to what happened. Colossians chapter 4, and Philemon is in the church at Colossae. So this is a letter addressed to Philemon's uh, home church. And Colossians is written at the same time as the book of Philemon. These letters were both written while Paul was under house arrest. And as he's giving his farewell greetings, in verse 8, he says, I am sending him, this is Tychus, to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. So by the sounds of it, Onesimus, along with these other men, went back to the church in Colossae and delivered this epistle, this letter, to the church. Did Philemon do everything that Paul said? Beyond this, we're not quite sure. That'll be something we have to ask Philemon and Onesimus in heaven, we presume. But the message of the letter still stands. It answers this question, how powerful is love? We've seen here that love has the power to overcome social barriers. Philemon was a master, Onesimus was a slave. These were two men in two very different classes in society. And yet the love of the Christian faith equalized the two. Both Philemon and Onesimus would go into church, would sit down in the same pew, so to speak, both of them were equally in need of Jesus. Both were equally in need of salvation. The church was a way in which these, these social barriers, these different classes of people were erased and gotten rid of. There's no one more or less important 
in the church like there was in the outside culture at the time. One of my favourite sayings is, the footing at the cross is equal. No one gets to come to the cross and be more or less elevated. Everyone is equally in need of Jesus. Paul also emphasises that Onesimus and Philemon, they're part of the same mission for Jesus. He he, uh, several times talks about mission and ministry and evangelism. And he appeals to Philemon, Onesimus is a fellow labourer with you. He is someone who you need to work with, someone part of the mission that we have together. We've also seen that love has the ability to pay enormous debts. Paul appeals to Philemon and he goes, if, if he owes you anything, I'll do it. Paul intercedes on Onesimus' behalf because he loves him and says, if there's anything that he owes you, I'll pay the debt. And finally, we've seen that love is able to even overcome death. We presume that Philemon, being the kind man that is described in the letters, the pages of this letter, would not have treated Onesimus harshly when he received him. Even though it was well within his right to do so, he overlooked the debt that was owed to him and death was gotten rid of. So how powerful is love? It can overcome social barriers. It creates unity within the church. It can pay enormous debts and it can overcome death itself. The question then that Philemon poses to us is, What would we do for love's sake or for the sake of love? What are we willing to do for the sake of the love that we should have between fellow brothers and sisters in the church? Our inability to show love will almost always result in disunity, in us fracturing and tearing ourselves apart. And this is exactly what Satan would love to see. When the church is divided, when there is no unity in the church, it is impossible for them to fulfill their mission and their purpose. How can they go out and share the gospel when the gospel isn't even a real and relevant thing in their lives? If there's no love in the church, how are they to show that love to the outside world? Satan is looking for any opportunity, anything he can use to tear apart a church. And get rid of the love that should exist there. If he can get the church to argue about internal politics, all the better. If people start becoming team pastor, team head elder, team Sabbath school leader, what have you. If he can get people to divide into little groups and factions, get people to argue, that suits him fine. But love should be able to overcome any of these difficulties. Perhaps there are differences even in church decisions. Well, I don't like the way we did this evangelism series. I'm not a fan of the new pews or the new carpet that we got. I don't like the way that the church looks. Small little things that can so often be divisive, that can be hills that people are willing to die on, and in the end, the mission of the church is sacrificed. Sometimes we even might have minor differences or perhaps sometimes even major differences in our beliefs. We need to agree on all of our fundamentals, but arguably there are some things that are not worth dividing over. Issues that in our church are not, will, uh, are not worth the price to pay of dividing a church. Perhaps it's even just something as small as we have a personal grievance towards someone. Someone offended us. Someone did something wrong to us. The question is, do you have the ability to forgive that person and move forward? If everyone's got some sort of history and bad backstory with people, how is the church supposed to fulfill its mission when all of these personal grievances have not been forgiven? How can it move forward when everyone is living in the past. All of these difficulties and challenges can be overcome if brothers and sisters in the church 
show love to one another. Love is the thing that is able to pay these debts. You might think, well, so-and-so did something to me. They owe a debt to me. They need to make it up in some way. If we take the example of Paul, Paul says, forget about it. For love's sake, give up that right you have to claim a a debt from that person or uh, to get justice in some way. Give it up for the sake of love. Our differences, whatever they may be, we need to learn to get along with people and to show love to each person. Now, showing this level of love is very easy to talk about, but very difficult to put into practice. But that is what we are called to do. And as I said at the beginning, often we like talking about love in wishy-washy terms because it's not very practical and we get to make of it whatever we want. But the Bible isn't giving us that wiggle room here. It's telling us in very precise terms what it means to actually show love, to forgive people, to settle differences, to move forward and work in tandem with other Christians for the mission of the church, to be united together, to overlook debts that you might have owed to you. Ultimately, If Christ has paid the ultimate debt for us, should we not also forgive the debts that other people owe to us? So my question for each of us this morning, in light of the story of Paul, Philemon and Onesimus, is what are you willing to do for love's sake? What would you be willing to do out of brotherly or sisterly love towards your fellow believer in the church?